The French Revolution changed the very fabric of France. Name of the system of government that operated. A system known as the Ancient Regime. So to understand the French Revolution, it's important to understand this ancient regime. So without further ado, let's crack on. Prior to the French Revolution, this chap, Louis XVI, reigned as king. After becoming the French Dauphin at age 11, amid the premature death of his brother and father, who, unsurprisingly, were also both called Louis, he would grow to become a shy teenager. The death of his grandfather, who, shock horror, was also called Louis, would land him on the throne at age 20. Overall, he's weak-willed and the public abuse him because he and his wife, Marie Antoinette, seem unable to make babies. An important feature, as the very purpose of their marriage was to prevent war between France and Austria through producing an heir. Not a good start to kingship. Nonetheless, his reign is still propped up by the divine rights of kings. Fragile though he is, Louis is the head of a large centralised government, and this large centralised government controls France, one of the most powerful countries on earth at the time. Louis consults councils for guidance on a weekly basis, namely the councils of the state, which deal with foreign affairs, the council of dispatches, which deal with communication and church business, and the council of royal finances, which manage economic policy. Yet, it is Versailles, not Paris, which is the centre of politics, where different factions compete for favour, patronage and sinecures. Louis is essentially a BMOC, a big man on campus. He controls who is appointed to positions and everyone wants to be his mate. However, as the quality of the governmental system is only as good as the people who constitute it, Louis is in part responsible for its flaws and we haven't even got to the complex system which sits below Louis. At the start of Louis's reign, France is composed of some 33 generalities, each one attended by a representative of the king known as an intendant. These fellas did all the fun stuff, controlling taxation, carrying out the king's orders, monitoring the courts, yeah, all the fun stuff. However, the intendant has to rely on the central government to back his decisions, and sometimes the central government would just be like, nah mate, we do not support this, jog on. To make matters worse for the intendant, he has to contend against the local government of the province. The province itself is headed by a provincial governor, aka a noble with despotic powers who has his own customs and traditions and is the embodiment of a personal dynasty which runs counter to the king, or in alignment with the king, depending on the noble. This must be quite frustrating for the intendant. On the one hand, he has to comply with what the local governor wants, and on the other, he has to work in alignment with what the king wants. And it's not always axiomatic whether those two things would be in compliance with one another. It's not really a situation I'd like to be in, but it beats being a peasant and, and, and eating rats for breakfast. Anyway, we can see that there are administrative flaws here. The system is flawed on its centralised front to the extent that it's hard to get things done and it is usurped on the decentralised front by the clash between the governor and the intendant. There are also some special provinces which have attained the privilege of controlling their own fiscal policy and taxation. These are known as pays de tars. I probably butchered that. I'm English. What can I say? I don't learn other languages because when I do, I butcher them. Not because I want to but just because I lack the intellectual capacity to speak them well. Anyways, there are also the parliaments, which can be thought of as courts. These play an interesting role. They both legitimise laws and scrutinise the king. If the king were to do out daft, which you can imagine an absolute monarch could in fact do, then they could issue what's known as a remonstrance to obstruct it. Conversely, if the king wanted to override the courts, he could issue what's known as a lead de justice a means of overriding the court's will in favour of his own. There was therefore a lot of tension between the king and parliaments. Ultimately though, the governing structure of pre-revolutionary France was not one which provided for a cohesive nation. Differing regions have different laws and these different regions have different governments that can often work against the implied dictates of the central government and its associated intendant. Change is hard to come by and change is hard to institute. And when this system stands inflexibly in the front of better ideas, in the front of enlightenment principles, that is when revolution 
becomes imminent. I thought that was pretty good foreshadowing for the next episode, which is going to be on the Enlightenment. Oh, and if you could do me a favour, slap a like on this video and give me a cheeky sub. It really would help out the channel, which is relatively new and quite small. Thank you. This video is over now. Over now.